Okay. It looked like we're all in our positions and so forth. Uh, David is going to come and he's going to do two things. We have David to read scripture and have David also to pray. And uh, when I was David's age, I was so blessed. Uh, I did not know I was that blessed. In a very small two Sunday a month church, our pastor came to church. He preached, he had three churches. Uh, St. John Missionary Baptist Church was a first and third Sunday church. He had another church in the rural area, which was second and fourth Sunday. He had another church that was only the fifth Sunday. When I pastored my first church, I was 20-something. I was like 23. I was handsome like you. Um, that church had a pastor who had five churches. So when I went to the church, I asked him, when they called me as their pastor, I said, I want us to be full-time. And they said, we don't believe in full-time. We'd like, we like to go visit other people. So they would only accept two Sundays. That was second and fourth Sunday. And I preached a message, a part-time church trying to do a full-time job. And as soon as I went to seminary and um, down in New Orleans, um, the next pastor they called, they said, we don't want a part-time church, we want a full-time pastor. And that church just became one of the neatest churches in the community. So when I look at you, it makes me think about myself. I'm not as handsome as you all. <laughs> But I'll get over it, okay? All right, so you lead us in the word, and then you pray for us as well, okay? All right, let's get ready, guys. Yeah. Yes, you need a mic. See, you know all the right things. He asked for a mic. That's a good, good, good sign there. You ready? Very good. Uh, good, ev good evening. Can you turn your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 22? And I'll be reading one verse, verse number 6. Proverbs chapter number number twenty two verse number six. Give them time. Once they finish the page turning, let's see it. It's still turning. Good. Very good. Sort of thing. You want to look around? There you go. Six. Are you ready? Are you ready? Okay. All right, let's go. Let's stand up nice and straight and read, okay? Mm -hmm. Train a child in the way we should go, and when he is old, he will not turn from it. That's it. Very good. Why don't you pray for us now? Yeah. Let's pray. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, let's hope, let's uh, have a good night. Let's uh, pray for everybody that didn't show up, and let's bless the Lord, and bless him for the rest of our lives. Amen. Thank you. Excellent. Let's give God praise. Amen. <laughs> Incredible. Let me give this mic to an unworthy person here. Thank you so much. Appreciate it so very much. All right. Tonight, um, we're going to begin uh, with, a, um, with a biblical principle uh, that I pray that we will pack it in our bags and take it with us and let it live within us. It's a very simple principle, and sometimes the things that are simple are the most complicated in our life. Now, we're all in our individual areas. Uh, let's see here. Number one, say amen. Amen. Number two, say amen. amen. Number three, say amen. Number four, say amen. amen. Number five, say amen. amen. Number six, say amen. amen. And number seven, with three men, say amen. amen. Say amen again. Amen, amen one more time. Amen. Three men. Now, who's the Father, who's the Son, who's the Holy Ghost? We want to talk about that. Okay, very good. <laughs> All right. We're going to divide the church to unite the church. You're going to come back to your places eventually. But what I like to do, I like to have all of the ladies on this side over here, all ladies over here, all the ladies, or all ladies over here, all the ladies over here, all ladies, all right over here, all ladies, all ladies. 
No talking, no talking, no talking, no talking. Nice and quiet. All ladies over here. And I want y'all to be sort of bunched together so you can turn and twist and talk to each other. But all ladies here. Get some more ladies up front here. All ladies. We want all the guys, the men over here, where there's only one real man in the house here. Come where the real man is. The rest of you guys are kids. Okay. Get to know it. Meet a real man. Okay? All the men over here, all the ladies are over here. Okay? Very good. Very good. All the ladies over here. Very ladies, I'm going to read out to you guys. Can y'all still see it if I put it here? Y'all see it? All right. Hot like that? Okay. I want you to take out your notes and turn to the back of your page and the back side of it. And then your question is this. Have you ever met, and where we are at, let me show you where we are at so you can see what I'm, what I'm doing. Okay, just one second. See what we're doing here. We are addressing, if you have the packet here, uh, saints and men, whoever have one. Michael, do we have, do we have the packet? Are you, I took them all away. Okay, the, the little packet with... Only one? Okay, okay, no problem. I'll just, I'll just uh, share mine then and make it happen that way. Okay, I think I left, I think I have the other one somewhere or another. I must have did something with them. Let's see. You have job security because I, I knoweth not what I doeth. Okay, here we go, that'll work. Okay, I want the, this is the page here, ladies, right here, and you want to deal with this. Here it is. And you can read that to all the ladies, whoever want to read, feel comfortable to do that. Read the materials on this page here to all the ladies. And your question is this, ladies, as y'all discuss together, um, we need to have somebody who's, who, who has been the recorder? Just raise your hand. Any recorder in here? Very good. We, you're the recorder, okay. Who's been the leader in the group? The leader, the leader? Okay. Okay. Leader? Leader? Who was a leader? Okay, leader. Okay, leader right there. Okay. All right, here we go. Have you ever met a truly submissive wife? What does a submissive wife look like? Why do some wives fail to submit to their husbands? What will it take for a wife to submit to her own husband? Okay, when I was pastoring, I had women in the church that was married to deacons and so forth. They were more kinder to me than they were to their own wives. Excuse me, whatever, yeah. <laughs> so they were kinder to me than they were their own husband. Thank you so much, right? I just need you so much, Jamie. And they would buy gifts for me. I had one lady who bought, bought me a suit, two or three suits, all the time. They bought me stuff all the time. And I stopped taking some of that stuff because I asked the husband, and they were not telling their husband. So I stopped taking it. Because if you're giving me something, not telling your husband about it, there's something wrong with that, OK? So anyway, um, I still take the suit, though, OK? Uh, but anyway, um, I want you to address those. And then your leader is going to report on what you find. I want you to discuss it, talk about it, dive into it real quickly, OK? All right, gentlemen, let's come down where you all are, where y'all is. Okay, let you read that document first and then we'll see where you all is here. And the ladies are not going to be listening to what we're saying either because this is secret, okay? This is secret. They're not listening. Okay, here we go. To the guys. Can y'all see that, gentlemen? Okay, I'm going to give you a um, little sheet here. I may have one on here. Sure, I do. I know what I'm going to give you. Yeah, I got it. Bingo. Excuse the writing on it. I changed a couple of things, but it'll work. I, I did some changes. Who was the leader in the group? In, in your group, who was the leader? Raise your hand. The leader. Okay, you're the leader of the group? Who is the leader in the group? Okay, 
Pete, okay. Who was the recorder in the group? Who was the recorder in the group? The recorder. Recorder, very good. You, you, can you do it? Okay. All right, very good. Pete, you'll read that to everybody, and you may want to come up here so you can, they can see you. But this is the question I want us to ans answer, and I want you to, to facilitate this. Have you ever met a truly submissive husband? What does a submissive husband look like? Why do some husbands fail to submit to their wives? What will it take for a husband to submit to his own wife? Okay? Yep, go for it. Now, you're going to read the other pieces in it, and this, the little, that, that's what you want to read right there, okay? One of the things that God began to show to me is um, the culture that we're in is so toxic that we don't even understand that we're being contaminated. Our kids on our phones, our pads, our ears, our nose, and our throats. You go to have dinner together at a, at a restaurant, everybody got their own iPhone, nobody talking to each other. High tech has created a self-exaltation um, and isolation in, in the relationships. And judgment will begin at the house of God. God's going to judge us, the righteous, for not doing what we need to do. We got to change some of that. I, I got an iPhone, iPad, I ears, all those things. I watch, I got, I got all that stuff. It's difficult to control it. And there is a redacting of terminology that is occurring in our culture. And we've really got to get a handle on it in the church. And we'll get some more things in a few minutes. Okay, Vic, ready. Thank you. You're going to share what you all talked about in, the, in relationship to the question. The first one was, have you ever met a truly submissive husband? You can just read that then. Give us, uh, I think it's, it's on. Let me see. Yeah, it's on. It's on, yeah. It's on now. Can you hear me? Yeah, got gotcha. you. Okay. This one is, uh, we talked about, have you ever met a, submi a truly submissive husband? I have. Uh, and I was lucky enough to meet one when I was a young man in junior high. I worked on a dairy farm, and he was a Baptist preacher. Um, he, him, and his, him and his wife loved each other very much. Because when I, we'd milk cows in the morning, they'd feed me breakfast before I went to school and everything, and you could just, you could just tell it. They had it, the, the kids. Um, he, he, was, he was a good man. He was a good role model. Not just for his family as a Christian man, but as me. Because even when I went in high school, I mean, you didn't see, I mean, even when I went to school, you had, you, the roughest thing you had was alcohol, which is still not, you know, still not good. But now it's, it's so much more. And you got drugs and everything else, teenage pregnancy. I didn't see that in my school. You know, of course, I graduated in the 80s. Some of you here are. Probably weren't even born yet, so. But, and then, what does a submissive husband look like? Um, uh, we we had talked about that um, uh, Christ-like. You know, you because you, you know you need to love your wife. You need to love your wife as much as God loves you. Um, why do some husbands fail to submit their own wives? For one thing, is is because they're not looking toward Jesus. Um, you have to look. You have to look toward Jesus, and the example that He set, that He loved everybody, and, and again, like I, I read in Genesis, you know that the two become one. They're not supposed to be separated. They're supposed to be one flesh. And what will it take for a husband to submit to his wife? Is he's got again got to turn his eyes toward Jesus. You, you got to. Um, and the husband, this gentleman here, is right. The, the husband has to set the has to set the um, he he has to set the standard. 
Because if I remember correctly, even in Genesis, when, when Eve was getting ready to take a bite of the apple, the Bible even mentioned that Eve, or Adam, was standing right there beside her and didn't stop her. So even as men, we have to, be, we have to take accountability for what happens as ourselves and with our wives and with our family. We have to take that accountability. So. Excellent. Let's give God praise Thanksgiving. Come on. Thank the Lord. Amen. Okay, my dear. I'll bring that little thing over here for you, sir, if you want to look at that, dear. I move over here. I move it more towards the center for you. Oh, you, you can do that. Yeah, be my guest. Mm -hmm, that's fine. Here you go. So for question number one, have you ever met a truly submissive wife? Um, our group actually said no to this because we kind of broke down the word truly submissive. And that for us meant all the time, 100% of the time, seven days a week, 24 hours a day. And we all said no. So, <laughs> um, because we felt like um, with that word truly submissive, that that me, um, a lot of people look at that as perfect. And we decided that um, we've none, none of us have met a truly perfect submissive wife. And we did um, reference the Proverbs 31 woman in that, and that she really was truly um, submissive in her ways. And then on question number two, what does a submissive wife look like? Um, we wrote down that that is selfless, respectful, submissive to authority, and a leading. And we referenced um, what 1 Peter 3 has to say about a submissive wife. And um, those things, it says in um, 1 Peter 3 that um, wives in the same way submit yourselves to your own husbands so that if any of them do not believe the word, they may be won over without words by the behavior of their wives when they see the purity and reverence of their lives. Your beauty should not come from outward adornment um, and elaborate hairstyles and wearing gold and jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is worthy in God's sight. Um, so we also talked about um, being meek and gentle, willingness and um, not conditional. So for number three, why do some wives fail to submit to their husbands? Um, we put um, the culture, sinful nature, not acceptable, brokenness, um, not respected, and selfish excuses. And we did talk about how our culture um, does look very much, it frowns very much upon us as Christian women, um, that whole word of authority and submissiveness, that it's frowned upon that you are weaker, you're the weaker vessel, and... Um, even being a doormat, and that is not at all what um, God says in his word. Again, on number four, what will it take for a wife to submit to her own husband? Um, we talked about learning to submit to God first and obedience. Dying to oneself is um, what obedience is, and then it's only through the Holy Spirit and God's strength. Amen. Give God praise. Amen. Excellent job. Excellent. 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 Take, take your time. Got it? Very good. Thank you. Hey, Craig, hold this for me. All right. <clears throat> Moving right along real well. We're going to drop a few nuggets on us here so we can see this here. The word, the New Testament, for submit is hupotasso, H-U-P-O-T-A-S-S-O. -S -S it's in the New Journey book on page 142, so you'll see that. Hupotasso, H-U-P-O-T-A-S-S-O, -S hupotasso. Hupo means under, tasso means to arrange oneself beneath. It's almost like bowing down in submission. Hupo means under. Tasso means to arrange your life in such a way that the order and the arrangement of your life is the order of submission 
and surrender to God. So, hupotasso, Greek word for it, is an, a military expression of an idea to rank under, to rank under. Biblical submission always emanates from a godly fear or respect. Where there is godly fear, we call that reverential fear. The word reverential means reverence as opposed to disrespect. Disrespect detaches us from the blessings of God, the freedom of true intimacy and relationship, and it's, it's a contaminant that causes us to begin to see ourselves as the enemies. Reverence begins first with God. We respect God first. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto us. Now, that phrase, added unto us, the implication there is this. There are things that God can add to us because we have not sought him first. Okay? So when we do things before God directs us as a Christian, we are out of sync with God and the blessings that God has in store for us. In other words, if we do not trust God, then God can't trust us. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, trust in the Lord with all thine heart. Lean not on what you understand, but in all your ways. That word ways is the word horos, which means path. All your paths, everywhere you go, the path to which you go, he will direct your path. He will give you the guidance. He will provide the, the signs, the stop signs, and all the other signs to give you direction and guidance as to what to do. He will guide you around through difficult places and difficult situations. He'll guide you around wicked and evil spirits. He'll guide you to the right place where you need to be. As long as you're walking and being right in line with his will, he will guide you <coughs> and direct your life. Then he would take the things that you do go through <clears throat> that are difficult things. He will use those things to strengthen you and to help you to be more of what he wants you to do. So we don't run from our problems. We go through our problems. And when we go through our problems, that's where we get experience, wisdom, understanding, knowledge. If we run from it, 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 we never, ever <clears throat> grow up and become mature. Okay? <clears throat> So, Luke uh, 2, 51, Romans 5, 7, Luke 10, 17, Luke 10, 20, Romans 8, 20, Romans 10, 3. Because someone had pop up like popcorn and let's, Mr. Mike, pop up like popcorn and let's do Romans 10, 3. Who is that? All right, thank you so much, Romans 10, 3. I appreciate that popcorn popping up. Thank you so much for popping up. Thank you so much. I appreciate that so much. I just love volunteers. Ain't nothing like it. I guarantee you. It's so wonderful. So the scriptures are Luke 2, 51, Luke 10, 17, Luke 10, 20, Romans 5, 7, Romans 8, 20, Romans 10, 3, and then James 4, 7. Somebody find James 4, 7, and when we finish with, uh, with uh, Romans uh, 10, 3, we're going to pop up and read that. Okay, let's read that. You got it? Very good. Okay. Yeah. Okay, let's do it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Romans 10, 3. Read it nice and slow and easy. Romans 10, 3 says, For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own righteousness have not submitted to the righteousness of God. That's the hoopo tasso. Read that one more time. For they, being ignorant Ignorant. Of, that word ignorant, ignoria, which literally means absent of understanding. Okay? To be absent of understanding. And when we're absent of understanding, watch this now. Understanding is a visible word. We have understanding. When you're standing on the ground, you have something holding you up, called the floor or something that you're standing on. When there is no understanding then you're standing on nothing. Okay? Which means that you can fall through the cracks. You may be a Christian 
You may be a Christian. You may know Christ as your Lord and your Savior, okay, as your Savior, but you haven't spent enough time with him to invite him to be the Lord of your life. Now, I want to be very careful about saying all this because it's not about perfection. I'm not talking, because I, I have more fleas on me than a dog that got mange, okay? I am not all that in the back. If my wife was here, she would clearly tell you he ain't all that, okay? I ain't all that, okay? I already know that. My wife reminds me of that. You ain't all that, okay? <laughs> that was a good sermon, Go live it. <laughs> you did good teaching, what you going to do with it? I mean, that's my word. You, you, you talked about giving, I'm going shopping. Come on. I mean, she, 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 she just takes me where I need to go. So we're not all that. But that doesn't mean that we have to stay where we are. Don't use that as an excuse to be not something that you should be. And say, I'm, I'm, just, I'm not all that, so I'm just going to continue to be where. That's not good, okay? Read a little bit more. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. Ignorant. Go ahead on. And seeking to establish their own righteousness. Okay, stop right there. The word righteousness, the word is dakalsune, which means to be in right standing, right position, in the right place, for the right reason, with the right people, for the right purpose. Righteousness. Righteousness is being right in the right things that you're doing. When you see something that's out, out of rightness, you need to run from it, okay? Instead of running to it, run from it. Righteousness is a positional word where God is able to see us standing on what is right because right will always win. For you shall know the truth and the truth will set you free, okay? Okay, go ahead. <clears throat> have not submitted to the righteousness of God. That's that hupotasso word, have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Isn't that a shame? Isn't that sad? That you can be a Christian and just be saved, but you don't want to make Christ the Lord of your life. You don't want Christ to be the Lord of your resources, the Lord of your finances, the Lord of your faith, the Lord of your family. But yet you're saved. Guess what? You're missing God's best. Look at the person next to you and say, you're missing God's best. Okay, thank you so much. All right, my brother here. Yes, sir, give, give him the mic there. All right, let's pop up like popcorn. That'll be James 4-7. James 4-7. Knock it out, Doc. James chapter 4, verse 7 says, Submit yourself, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Look at that process. Submit. Read it one more time. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Submit, okay, first, to God. What else? Resist the devil. Resist the devil. What and else? And he will flee from you. And he'll run out of town. You got that now? Submit to God. Resist the devil. He's just a boogeyman. he get out of town. He's just a bully. Okay? In other words, don't let the boogeyman cause you to have boogie problems. Okay? That's only just the problem. Go through that problem. Stand firm with God. Submit your life to the principles of God. Now, I'm not telling us that everything is going to be perfect all the time. It will not be. I am not saying that. But what I am saying, that whatever you go through, God will not let you down. And even if you have to suffer, go through a lot of garbage, a lot of trash, a lot of junk, he'll use all of that to give you wisdom and insight and experience and perseverance. He'll build your muscles. He'll build your faith. That will not be overlooked by God to strengthen you that you may be a blessing to somebody else in your family. Okay? All the mess you deal with, God can take that mess and turn it into a masterpiece. Okay? All right, now. Let me hit a, I think, I think that's it. Is it, Logan? I think that's it. Yeah, that's it. Very good. All right. We're going to shift gears here and dive in our water here, if I can find my little clicker here. So it begs the question, what is a spiritual awakening? J.I. Packard, the principle, he says, is the principle of quickening. 
So a spiritual awakening is the principle of quickening. It, God quickens us and alerts us to the things that's on God's heart. There is a quickening, a quickening, a, a quickening of the Spirit of God that helps us to experience his presence, which causes us to be attuned to and awakened by the presence of his power in our life. God's quickening visitation. God's quickening visitation. Who did that? Yeah. God's quickening visitation. God's quickening visitation. It is God's presence that comes upon us. He visits us, and there's something dynamic that happens to us in a quickening of our spirit and alerting us. Robert Byrd says the principle of season, of a season of extraordinary seasons of religious entrance. Byrd says the principle of season, extraordinary season of religious interest. Religious interest implies a, a, a burning desire to feast from the table of plenty and the blessings that God has for us that's in his holy word, okay? Stephen Alfred says the principle of sovereignty, the principle of sovereignty, the principle of sovereignty, the principle of sovereignty. In other words, we're talking about living a principle-driven life and not a haphazard life, a life that's operated by principles, understanding the principles of God and operating in those principles that shields us from living a life haphazardly, and so forth. He says, it is the sovereign act of God. Now, that sovereign act of God is the activities of God that operates around us and helps us to understand that if we're operating under the sovereignty of God, God is sovereign, he's all-knowing, all-seeing, all-understanding, he's ever-present, all those nuances of God, he is ever-present, he never sleeps, he never fails, he's always there. The more we meditate upon that, I am not saying that life is going to be hunky and dory, but God will give you the strength and the perseverance and the understanding to know what to do, how to do it. And even if you slip and fail, God will pick you up, re your life, re-strengthen you, and give you the things that you need for his glory. J. Edwin Orr, the principle of refreshment. And that's very important in the body of Christ. We are here to refresh each other to strengthen each other, to bless each other. Refreshment, Robert o. Edwin, J. Edwin Orr. This is Acts 9, 319, times of refreshings. There are seasons that we go through in life. There are seasons of plenty. Then there are seasons of want, famine. There are seasons of joy. Then there are seasons of distress. There are seasons where everybody loves you. And there's a season where nobody, even your dog, don't want to see you, you know? There are all different kinds of seasons in life. And as a Christian, as a, a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, as a disciple, whatever season we're in, be it winter, summer, spring, or fall, our faith and our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus Christ in righteousness. We dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock we stand, all of the ground is sinking sand. We persevere. Robert Coleman, the principle of awakening, the principle of awakening, the principle of awakening, the principles of awakening. The awakening or quickening of God's people. Here's a critical point. We need to wake up in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. God has blessed us with an incredible church, with an incredible pastor who has an incredible vision, with some incredible leaders, and some incredible people. The question is, what are we going to do with it? Do we got to be begged to do something all the time? Or are we seeking to make ourselves available so God can use us? Okay? Charles Finney, the principle of repentance, repentance, repentance. We talked a little bit about repentance last night. Repentance means to, to make a change in 
another direction. Confession is perpetual. You can confess all day long. I messed up. I messed up. You keep doing the same thing over and over and over and over again. Repentance is, God, I'm finished with this stuff. I'm through with it. I'm tired of me. There come a time we ought to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. I'm trying to remember something someone said is is coming to my mind right now. Uh, It is. It says, when the pain to change, when the pain to change and we don't change, it takes the pain. I can't get that down. I can't even get it. The The pain to change remains the same. We won't change. In other words, God has to give enough pain to cause us to change. Okay? God has to take us to a place where we have never been before and give us a gluteus maximus whipping and put his foot on our neck and pull our pants down or pull up your can-can the way my mother did on the front porch in Law, Mississippi on South 8th Avenue with all my sister's friends out there and mom pulled that can-can up. She bowed over and she wore her out and told her to go outside and play. God has to do that to us sometimes because we are deaf, we're not, we're not willing to listen, we won't take God in his word, and I've been there myself. Okay, I'm sure none of us have been there. I've been there. I have been stuck on stupid because stupid was stuck on me. Okay? And God had to get the stupid out of me, and I pray every day, God, make me a little bit more unstupider, a little bit less stupider. Okay? Look at your neighbor and say, you look stupid. (laughs) Y'all ain't doing it. Look at your neighbor and say, you look stupid. Eunice said, I ain't doing that. (laughs) The return to the church from her backsliding. Repentance, backsliding, backsliding. Constantly going backwards instead of going forward. We are soldiers in the army of the living God. We ought to be conquering kingdoms, destroying strongholds, and doing those things that only God can do through us. But most of the time, beloved, we're just a bunch of chickens going backwards, waiting for the chicken truck to pick us up and take us to Tyson. Lord, help us. Richard Owen Roberts, the principle of spirit. The principle of spirit. Richard Owen Roberts, the principle of spirit. An extraordinary movement of the Holy Spirit. Watch this now. An extraordinary movement of the presence of the Holy Spirit. When the spirit of the living God comes and rests upon this church and ignites us with that extraordinary, super-duper Holy Spirit feel power. And I'm not talking about Pentecostal. uh, uh, I'm not talking about stuff that people say, that's just weird. I'm talking about the presence of God at work through the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity that does his work in our lives. Okay? He is alive and well. Duncan Campbell, the principle of Cornelia, Cornelia saturation, Cornelia saturation, Cornelia. The word Cornelia from the word corne, which means common. The word Cornelia means a common people with a common connection. It is called communion. When we have communion, we're having what is called Cornelia. And the word Cornelia is from the word corne uh, in the Old Testament, the New Testament. Greek is written in corne Greek, which means dirty Greek, common Greek, street language. So during the New Testament writing, the writers of the New Testament were basically people who, who came from this common, ordinary kind of common sense kind of stuff. And they called that corne common or dirty Greek. Corne Greek, common, common, common. Okay? A community saturated with God. The word community is the same word koinonia. We are fellowship of baptized believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Upon this rock I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Amen? So Jesus has built this church on the rock, and Jesus, he's the rock. Okay? And that's why we call our church the cornerstone. Every now and then people say, where are you guys? I go to the stone. They say, are you, you, you stone? I said, man, I'm stone. 
It's my word against. I said, look, man, we, we, every Sunday we get stoned at our church. He said, oh, my God, let me, I got to get over there. I said, man, pastor be passing out the wine, man. We be getting stoned. Man, can I come over? <laughs> <laughs> then he get hit by a brick and Jesus get him saved. Isn't that good? All right. Earl Corns, Inogeo, Inogeo, Inogeo principle. The word Inogeo, like energy, Inogeo. Ever read about it? Inogeo principle. Earl Corns. The work of the Holy Spirit, Inogeo. The word Inogeo means the ongoing work that's working within us, that energizes us, that strengthens us, that when we get tired and we just can't take any more, something kicks in. One of my sisters in the Lord, Cynthia, she was so funny. Um, she talked about a pastor preached a sermon, everybody needs a backup generator. When everybody else's lights go out, that backup generator kicks in. Every one of us have a backup generator. That's that extra power from God. Our lights should never go out. Amen? So the Holy Spirit, the work of the Holy Spirit, who brings fire. But there is a problem, a problem. And uh, let's see here. What do the Lord wants me to do here? There is a problem. Somebody say problem. There is a problem. Amen. Problem, problem, problem. Get this together here. Got a few more minutes. I plan to stop there. I think I'm going to keep rolling. I'll make sure we get it all. Okay, there we go. There's a problem. So what is the problem? Here it is. The problem is sin, the sin of desertion. We don't know how to pray. Okay? We no longer spend time in God in prayer. Okay? And many of our churches today do not have prayer meetings. We don't pray. Some churches you go to, they don't, they don't open up in prayer. They don't read scripture. No prayer. People don't know how to pray. So if you don't know how to pray, you don't develop a prayer life, you leave yourself open for the evil one to come in and really take you under. Every one of us as Christians need to have a prayer life. And we talked about a prayer life. If you don't have a prayer life, you don't have a life. And a prayer life is more than saying emergency prayers. Like, oh, oh God, I don't know what to do. My two-year-old just told me that she didn't like me. Spank that two-year-old. Okay? Spank it. Okay? Like my mom used to say, if you don't spank them, they'll spank you. Okay? If you don't discipline them, they will discipline you. Okay? The problem of desertion means to abandon, to abscond, to disappear, or to depart, or to neglect, or to go AWOL, or discard. Desertion. When prayer experiences desertion, the Christian community, pastors, staff, CEOs, leaders, worshipers, classes, ministries, members, and even sinners fail to experience the power and the presence of God. So in other words, people can come to church and leave the same way they came because the folks in the church are so carnal, they have no relationship with God. They come in and go, 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 and nothing ever changes in their life. Like, praise God, we have life change at Cornerstone. Can I get a witness? Somebody say amen. amen. Now say amen like you mean it. Every dog got a bark in his back. Let's amen. Amen, amen again. Amen. amen just one more time. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. I agree with that. Where there is no prayer, there is no power. Okay? In the Christian community, pastors, CEOs, staff, leadership, worshipers, educators, ministries, members, and even in the life of the sinners, the backsliders, and the hypocrites, and the harlots, okay? Every one of us 
was either lost and on our way to hell and enjoying it, or we were lost and asking God to give us help. And he helped us to turn that corner and get right with him. Can I get a witness tonight? Prayer equals power, no prayer, no power, little prayer, little power, okay? If you're not having a time with God every day, reading your Bibles, meditating on Scripture, memorizing Scripture, if you're only coming to church on Sundays and just getting the message that our pastor always has a great word, you are not going to make it. You have a personal responsibility to come into the church already half cocked. You ought to come in, you ought to have bullets in your gun. Pastor, get the preacher, you go, and you ought to just light a match sometimes. Say, I'm so hot, and throw a match on yourself. Boom, and you just blow up. And then people drive by and they see the smoke coming out of our church, Jimmy. They say, that church is on fire. Okay? Instead of a bunch of stone-faced people. Help us, Lord. Somebody said amen. Or somebody say ouch. Unfortunately, there are far too many Christian communities have little prayer and little with little power in the staff members, the administrators, the leaders, the executive leadership, and instructors. Okay, far too many. So what is the solution? So what is the solution? The solution is practicing an effective prayer life. I think I'm going to stop right there, beloved. But before I stop and let us go here, I have something I want to show us here. I think we stopped there. I believe so. Let me see where we're at. Then we're going to quit real soon here. Give me a minute. Let me hit a couple more. Okay. Let me see this. Okay, yeah. Let me hit one more, two, two more. Here we go. The fundamentals of 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 an of, of an oh man, that's where I get that at. I must have missed something. I can't see it. Okay, let's go. Practicing an effective prayer life ignites the fire of God in the community of faith. Effective and ignites. Practicing an effective prayer life ignites the uh, the ignites the fire of God in the community of faith. I can't quite see that. i got to change the color on that. can't quite see it. It's hard to see, isn't it? Okay, then the last one, I believe. And we'll rest our case there. Very good. Yeah. So, all right. Practicing effective prayer life. Little Raven Hill says, no man slash woman is greater than his or her prayer life. Why Revival Terror? It's a great book to read. You can pick that up. I'm going to stop off at this point here, and then I have one thing I want to say after it. So what is prayer? We'll stop right there. What number slide is that, uh, Brother Tim? 52. Excellent. Thank you, sir. I want to share something with us, and we're going to let us go. My uh, granddaughter, her birthday, Eunice, could you come and help me out? Uh, Kelly, could you come and help me out? Let's see here. I don't know everybody's name, so would you mind coming and helping me out too? Thanks, okay. I'm learning that. Eunice, you take this, darling. You take this right here, and I want y'all to open it up and look at it. I was looking for a card for my, my granddaughter and so forth. Okay, ladies, y'all go around and show that to everybody. Just walk around and show it to him, okay? Go ahead and show it to him. Walk around and show it to him. Walk around. Let every, uh -uh, everybody just walk throughout the congregation and show it to everybody. Let them see it. I'm not. I've, I got a different card, sweetie. I just want them to walk around. The ladies walk around and show it to you. Then I have something I want to say to us after they do that. Y'all see that? Take a look at it. They sell those at CVS. 
That's a part of Hallmark cards. I bought those and I talked to the people there. I'm writing a letter to Hallmark, I'm gonna call them. They're not gonna listen to me. I already know that, make too much money. Told a lady about it, she said, well, I'm, I, I, whatever. They don't care. But you know something, beloved? I'm not talking about perfection. Please don't hear me say that. I have more, do more fleas than a, than a mangy dog. And I, I, I pray, all, I need God to help me all the time. I know how imperfect I am, and I know I'm not all that in a bag of chips. And I'm blessed to have a wife to remind me of that. And my boys remind me of that too. And my granddaughter, Madison, told me, said, Dad, granddaddy, I love you so much, granddaddy. But sometimes when you're talking, I'm not listening to you. because You just be talking, 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 talking. <laughs> she said, basically, shut up. That's what she told me. But um, we are allowing the culture to teach our children. And if we don't get with the program and get our kids in the Word of God and really get serious about it, we're going down the toilet. We're living in the land of Sodom and Gomorrah. I never dreamt I'd see two men sitting off and getting married. I never dreamt I saw two lesbians and two transgenders and people. We are really messed up. And it is a symptom of the church. Go, us ain't got it together. We're not doing the thing we're supposed to do. We're not serving the way we should. We, we don't know our gifts. We're not, we're not interested in it. All we want to do is be entertained. Come and make me feel good. Entertain me. How was the, the pastor message? Pastor preached a good message. What you going to do about it? Pastor, to, what you going to do about it? What you going to do about it? What you going to do about it? My prayer is that God will pass us not and come in this house and change our hearts. And that means that when people come to church, don't be sitting in the same places. Go meet them. Get to know them and lead them to Christ in the building. My prayer is when people come to church, they're already saved. And then pastor preaches the gospel and they get the, they come down and they're already saved and as the fish come down, they're already scant, they're already clean, and pastor bring them in one at a time, dropping the catfish in, the, in, in that nice, uh, clean oil. So they're coming down, shh, shh. Can you imagine if we had one person came to Christ by each and every one of us on Sunday? Pastor B, here, where is all my frying fish? We have to get pastor slain from frying so much fish. It's our job to lead people to Christ. And one of the things that I'm looking forward to do is to teach us about how to lead a person to Christ without going through the four spiritual laws, the five outlaws, and any other laws. It's about who we are in Christ and being real. Let's stand. Let's go.